So, good afternoon everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. And we're extremely happy to be here, and very happy also to celebrate um, the last Radical Kitchen on this like last sunny day. So, we are going to speak today about and basically present a project that we've been working on for the past uh, two years, and it's an ongoing project that's happening on the Out of Sky. And we prepared a presentation that can be viewed on the, in, on the story of, um, of the Serpentine Pavilion Instagram account. So, so yeah. like if logistically, you don't need to follow images, but if you want to see like also what we are talking about and have this you know, visual input, you can just do in Serpentine Galleries, the story has like a lot of images and we can also make signs that like next, next. It will pretty much, if you just let it run as we speak, it's very well coordinated to our performance. So very it's well. Like, <laughs> so we're just going to press the start button. Very good. The waters of sky have been changing color. We know that seawater has no color, but different color reflections enter our eyes, and sometimes we see blue. Sometimes we see gray or black. Other times we see brown or green. Yet in recent years, the seawater has been nominated by different hues and multiple pantones. You are looking at Pantone 15, 55U. Are looking at Pantone 1565U. Are looking at Pantone 1625U. Are looking at Pantone 1635U. Are looking at Pantone 1575U. Are looking at Pantone 487U. Are looking at Pantone 486U. Are looking at Pantone 1645U. Are looking at Pantone 16055U. Are looking at Pantone 1655U. Are looking at Pantone 485U. In Sky, we heard about a house sparrow that had turned salmon. House sparrows can be found in most places where there are houses. As their name suggests, they are one of the most common birds on the planet. Female and young birds have brown, grey or black feathers. While males have le sometimes less dull bits around their neck. But the sparrow we heard about in Sky had turned salmon. It was believed to have eaten one of the feed pellets from a salmon farm. Like a flamingo eating shrimps, the sparrow also turned salmon. Salmon today would be grey, but salmon can also be red or pink, or even salmon. In the water, the success of salmon, Scottish salmon, as a branding, relies on colouring salmon fish into one of 13 pantons. Farmed salmon needs pinky fine pellets to substitute natural krill, which is otherwise found in the water. Indeed, Scottish salmon today is neither entirely Scottish, nor is it wholly salmon. 90% of Atlantic salmon swimming in the seas and shelved on supermarket aisles is a domesticated species. And since the 1970s, salmon slowly ceased being an animal to become a profit equation. Selective breeding processes create fish which can grow much faster to market size than in regular conditions in the wild. Market salmon differs from wild salmon. It is fed with fish or pork-based pellets, mixed with ground-up beef, genetically modified yeast, and, and chicken fat. It is also colored artificially with pigments to make the flesh acquire the ideal salmon tone. It's marked with a black spot under its belly from vaccination. And its adipose fins are clipped, providing it from ever swimming in the wild again. It is heavily dependent on antibiotics to fight disease and parasites, like lethal sea lice, resulting from swimming in circles in close proximity. Grown in cylindrical open net farms containing about one million fish, market salmon is severely affecting the body of the fish, but also the entire seabed. Hundreds of kilos of fish manure sink through the open nets. Their excrements are deposited at the bottom of the sea, suffocating the entire ecosystem underneath and creating dead zones. Invisible suspended particles float away and give the water supplementary colors. 
these open nets function as toxic toilets with open water sewage, which is discharged onto the open seas by the tidal flow. One of the places we associate with salmon is Scotland, where wild salmon has been a food source for centuries. Since the 1980s, however, the appearance of multitude of salmon farms all over the country have been dramatically changing the water landscape. Two years ago, a moratorium on fishing wild salmon was passed in Scotland, as their numbers have been dramatically dropping. Fishermen have been blamed for its disappearance, while the environmental impact caused by industrial aquaculture is not held accountable. On the Isle of Skye alone, 15 salmon farms are currently growing millions of fish a year. Recently, many salmon had to be sacrificed in Skye as not even strong antibiotics could keep the sea lice under control in such high concentration of fish. Hundreds of thousands of fish have been exterminated in order not to threaten the entire industry. But still, the industry does not acknowledge any connection between lice infestations and the high concentration of animals swimming in the same pen. Farming corporations still claim that the parasite is simply a natural phenomenon. Instead of sacrificing fish, the industry has, become to try, has, has begun to try to kill off the sea lice with chemicals. Lice are becoming resistant to those chemicals, so greater quantities have to be used, together with more toxic components that are frequently found in pesticides, herbicides, and some nerve agents. Today, Scottish salmon does not entirely come from Scotland. Salmon hatching row is part of an intricate transnational circulation of precious genes with eggs fertilized and incubated in different facilities ready to be sent from farming site to farming site all across the world. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded themselves as purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon. Despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank with Ukrainian and Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange and used important Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek seafood Hjeldland sources salmon from the wild waters of Shetland, but what is wild is the water, not the fish. It is no surprise that Marks & Spencer salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness-sounding name, but Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes best of Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it actually the salmon is farmed in Norway and the Faroe Islands. Morrison's promotes, ca promotes catch of the day salmon, which is sourced from a farm in Norway, and Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway but only smoked in Scotland. The desire for consumption of Scottish landscape is rendered through fish matter. Five out of six of the salmon conglomerates operating in the Isle of Skye depend on Norwegian-owned capital and consist of corporations that were legally obliged to monitor the salmon farming activity in Norway. Despite disguising their operations through branches in different countries, the 11 largest salmon farming corporations in the world have still their headquarters in Norway. Given that the Norwegian government is introducing more environmental restrictions because of the detrimental effects of salmon farming on Norwegian coastal waters, some of these companies have found fertile ground and water in less restrictive countries, like Scotland or Chile. Marine Harvest, the largest salmon farming conglomerate in the world, is also operating in sky seas. The industry prefers to refer to chemicals as medicines and feed pellets as an all-natural diet. But their contaminating processes are many times disguised under the branding of so-called sustainable aquaculture practices. Scottish salmon has become a brand that needs to be critically rethought. Not only from an environmental and ecological perspective, but also questioning what the Scottish and salmon means in this construction. Farmed salmon is the result of the fish becoming a product of biocapital and biomass. It is a creature bred to be hungry, and its job is to put on weight. In order to quantify the salmon's success, the equation feed conversion ratio indicates the quantity of feed pellets, around three kilos, that equal in biomass gain of the fish, around one kilo. And that is the efficiency ratio, like three to one, with which feed pellets are converted into salmon flesh. 
The new feed pellet factory that has been built in Sky is meant to provide 55 jobs, undoubtedly an important amount for such a small island community. Yet it is still not entirely clear how many will serve local population and how many also will be long-lasting positions. At the same time, the new plant legitimizes the environmentally damaging presence of open-net salmon farms in the waters around the island to keep up with demand. Surrounded by the rugged landscape, indented coastline, and our lochs of sky, there are many ways in which market salmon performs nature. One of them it is, is how it is bred beyond natural reproductive seasons. Year-round consumer demand requires that the fish body is constantly fertile. Farms in northern latitudes deceive the fish to make them think that they are living in a different time of the year. For that purpose, a black roof dome is sometimes added on top of the open net farms to distort their perception, as if they were in a different season. In winter periods of 24-hour darkness, artificial fluorescent lights are turned on and off. And on and off. And on and off. And on and off. 12-hour cycles simulating light conditions of a spring, summer or autumn. Helped by artificial underwater heaters, the light regime triggers the reproductive season by deceiving their sense of orientation. Continuous light accelerates fish growth so that the farm can deliver salmon all year round. Their carefully engineered housing conditions have the power to advance or delay spawning time to produce eggs out of season. 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Some years have two summers. And others skip a winter. This accelerated growth has consequences for the fish, which, among other deformities, have damaged their otoliths and made the fish become deaf. Paradoxically, the fact that farmed salmon cannot hear reduces its stress from the very noisy machinery of the salmon farm. Another way to perform nature in a salmon farm is the creation of fake seaweed habitats as hiding spots for us. A fish being transplanted from the southwest coast of England to Scotland to eat the sea lice that attacks the salmon. Made with stri stripes of rubbish bags, these fake habitats allow rats to hide from hundreds of thousands of salmon swimming around in the pen and eat their sea lice comfortably. Another disruption in their reproductive system is the way escapees are trapped between being a domesticated and a wild species. Guided by a memory from the magnetic field or smell of a place, or even the sun, they orient their migration and with it they fulfill their sense of being. But bred in an onshore laboratory, farmed salmon lost that inherent sense of memory. It can no longer find its birthplace upstream and return there to spawn. It is disconnected from any natal river and disoriented in the sea, or providing that it ever escapes, where does it go? Homeless and outlawed, an escapee becomes an alien species in its original river. In Norway, for instance, escapees are listed as a threat to the wild salmon population. If they mix with their wild counterparts, the new fish will be part of that disrupted system. Only a few months ago, 21,000 salmon fish escaped from a farm in Skye. This raises the question of where is home for an, of an escapee and where can it find its way back upstream. If a farmed salmon swims home, it sometimes goes back to the hatchery that created a magnetic or olfactory imprint in its brain. Farmed salmon is only recently becoming an animal and less a product, with studies and regulations trying to understand its feelings, its memory, but also its sense of orientation. The question still remains what is a domesticated, a cultivated or a tamed salmon? Is farmed salmon an industrial aquaculture success or an environmental catastrophe? From the local habitat to the global market, the scales at which salmon performs are yet to be decultured. After decades of overfishing and exhaustive salmon farming, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology, and employment need to be rethought. 
Food seasons as we know them have ceased to exist. In the supermarket, you can find strawberries, tomatoes, plums, or even salmon all year round. You have all seasons. Beyond the flattened 365 day long season, what would be new periods we could eat according to today? If humans have been changing environments, how can we also change our food system to adapt to them and build other forms of landscape? Climavore explores how to eat as climate changes, a form of devouring that follows the consequences of anthropogenic landscapes affected by intensive forms of material extraction. Different from carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian or vegan diets, it is not so much the ingredients that define climavore, but rather the infrastructural response to human-induced climatic events. New seasons of food production and consumption have begun to appear. Dry seasons are sometimes more arid and sometimes less. Rainy seasons are becoming longer but sometimes shorter. The number of frost-free nights has increased in some places but decreased in others. These non-absolute cycles are discontinuous, disjointed, disconnected and non-sequentially repetitive. But do water levels justify digging deeper wells and exhaust even deeper aquifers? Or can we acclimatize our existence to flexible patterns beyond intensive water consumption? Denuding imaginaries, landscapes and infrastructures reveal a new set of clues for adapting our diet, anxieties and desires to them. How to water without water in a period of water scarcity or how to water with stones? Climavor aims to think or rethink the environmental futures of coastal inhabitation and the coastal commons through a diet that can effectively transform desires and infrastructure. In the case of polluted shores by salmon farms, it takes the tidal zone as an ambiguous zone of opportunity that appears, disappears, reappears, and constantly changes in size. Coastal space has no clear definition and opens up for murky, yet cleaner forms of usership, and can become today the entrance into a new ecology, economy, and cultural imaginary. Other understanding of aquacultures in sky and its tidal zones can become a site for more sensitive practices. Human-induced climatic alterations of the waters, ranging from increasing acidification of the ocean, appearances of new parasites, and disappearance of species, could be approached through other forms of eating and sourcing of nutrients. Different from intensive salmon farming that produces an excess of nitrogen, other creatures do opposite processes. They clean the water by breathing. And so do other filter feeder bi bivalves like clams, scallops, razor clams, or barnacles, but also seaweeds like kelp, siletos, or dolls. They all provide an incredible source of protein, uh, which is easy accessible, but also without any need for feed or fertilizers into the water. Despite having lost connection today to some of these ingredients, they were abundant and used by both humans and animals. There are archaeological remains of prehistoric sheep in Scotland with marks in their teeth that indicate a kelp-based diet. And even in modern time, a booming industry in the Isle of Skye emerged for kelp-based explosives during the Napoleonic Wars in the 1820s. Kelp was used to improve poor soils for millennia. In places like Jersey, in the Channel Islands, the use of seaweed collected from the ocean as fertilizer had been a common practice, with laws explicitly regulating citizens' rights and optimal seasons for its gathering. Certain varieties like kelp or bladderwreck had abounded quantities of minerals that once laid on the fields would slowly be released and accelerate the growth of vegetables and tubers. Crofters have used the tidal zone not only for fish traps, where all sorts of fish would ca be caught at, by the low tide, but also to forage dulls and eat it raw or boiled in soup. Over centuries, food sourcing from the tidal zone enabled social structures where women were the strength of fishing economies, from sorting oysters on the beach, lifting the catch, to carrying their husbands to shore so they don't wet their feet. Oysters have also been cheap sources of protein. In the east coast of the US, oyster traders had hybrid house barges from where they would moor on different piers to sell their stock to wholesale suppliers. 
Their mobile barges were a hybrid between a fishing facility, a shop, an impromptu eatery, and a home altogether. After sourcing oysters from naturally occurring beds, it was later discovered that they could be grown in oyster tables. Structures going hundreds of meters into the sea where oysters are washed by the tides following moon cycles. In Sky, our, our oyster table functions as a dining table and opens a discussion around other aquacultures that could happen on the island. Every day, at high tide, the structure is covered underwater and its thousand oysters are able to breathe, uh, each one filtering up to 120 liters of seawater per day. At low tide, it emerges above the sea and functions as a dining table where we placed some humans. Over breakfast, lunch and dinner, according to the tide, performance meals featured a series of climbover ingredients. Where workshops with fishermen, politicians, residents and scientists have been held to discuss another cultural imaginary for the island. Guests enjoyed bloody oyster cocktails, crunchy shingles or lasagna for sure and many other climbover delights. Aiming to divest away from salmon farming and develop alternative aquacultures on the island, a network of restaurants was also established, and each replaced farmed salmon in their menu with a climbover dish. We had a food truck, a local bakery, a pie shop, a bar, a hotel, a michelin star restaurant, and they all served different um, dishes, including a dull soup, coca kelp climbover ice cream, Climavor kelp whiskey, twice dived Climavor scallops, and Climavor rope grown mussel nibbles. The ongoing project is an expanding into a new permanent installation, the Climavor station, in the old ice house in Portree. To secure traineeships and placements for local teenagers from the professional cooking school. Through pedagogical and professional development, the future cooks of the island can start introducing the new coastal imaginary. The tidal zone is a space of opportunity for discussing the spatial constructions of the ocean and its shores, to rethink coastal policy and facilitate small-scale independent initiatives. The Climb of War Station, in that way, will also provide legal advice and consultancy on how to open your own oyster farm or your own kelp farm, but also support claims to reject planning applications that are constantly trying to expand existing salmon farms in the area and all of these while serving very kind of, exciting climb over dishes. Slowly, people coming up the sky would ask for sky kelp, sky dolls, sky oysters, or sky mussels, instead of Scottish salmon. Ingredients that regenerate the coast by breathing in this era of increasingly evident man-induced climatic events. On the tidal zone, we can determine together what we eat as climate is changing. So for today, our radical uh, kitchen lunch, we brought some oysters and we also prepared some seaweed bread and seaweed pesto that is going to be, some of it is already here and the oysters are going to be passed around now. And we have two kinds of oysters. One are rock oysters, which you'd see they're the more elongated one, which originate from the Pacific Ocean and are, can be found on the whole west coast of the United States and down into South America. And also what is known as the common oyster, which is more round and is endemic to Britain and Europe. Then the, well, just the, the, the bread is made with different kinds of seaweeds. Uh, it has low gluten, but it has a bit of gluten for the, those of you who are allergic. And you're welcome also to use the sauces or, or the lemons for the oysters. And we're very happy to answer any questions and open up the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.